the presentation in the computer, I can see the, the screen okay. but anyway. I will Thank try you, to do, <laughs> okay. I will try to manage with it. So, hello, good morning, bonjour. And um, I guess, uh, buenas tardes to Miguel Bañares. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I would like also to thank Professor Patins for this idea about uh, putting all the characterization techniques. Yeah, it's not, okay. Yeah, like I have. Can you hear me now? Is better? Okay, <laughs> thank you. So I just uh, wanted to, uh, to, to thank uh, uh, Professor Patien for this idea, but I think it's very, it's very useful to put all the characterization techniques together with the same for format. So it's a very useful information about the application of this different technique in, in chemical engineering. So I will try to briefly uh, present you our mini review about the, uh, the infrared spectroscopy. So uh, first I will, uh, yeah, it's, it's really difficult because I can see the screen. Can you, it's, it's, it's not possible that I can see so really complicated because I, I I thought that I was going to be able, but if I don't see the presentation is maybe. Yeah, because I thought that I could move, but as the microphone is here, I, I'm not able to move, so I cannot see the screen. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so infrared spectroscopy is, uh, is a very, very uh, common technique. It uh, has been used for many years in, the, in chemical engineering and in other fields of science. I would say that as the first highlight for this technique is that uh, it's like the finger trip, uh, in the, as the fingerprint of a molecule. So it's like a signal that is characteristic and that is uh, useful for identify a wide uh, variety of, of molecules. And in addition, uh, for, the, for the application of uh, IR spectroscopy, we have several configurations available, uh, as I will show you briefly. In addition, uh, this spectroscopy is very useful also, not only for the characterization of, uh, for example, a material or a liquid, but also for the characterization of the absorbent molecules, for example, on a solid, which is something very useful, for example, in catalysis. So we can use also uh, probe molecules that uh, absorb on the surface, so we can make a lot of studies, for example, to identify and to quantify the acid size or basic site or many other applications. So the wide application of air is really, really wide. So it's in the chemical engineering is very useful. I would say that the most interesting application is in catalysis. Since, uh, since uh, with this technique, we can uh, make uh, to the, the we can monitor uh, reaction because we can monitor the, the reaction products of a, of a chemical reaction. We can also use this technique for the material characterization of the, of the catalytic materials. And also we can use this spectroscopy for the uh, identification of absorbed species, which is something very useful in catalysis for the identification of, uh, of uh, Active size, active species, spectators, and so on. So we can uh, have very useful information about the mechanics of uh, of a reaction through this technique. So, as we as I said, this is uh, like a fingerprint because, yeah, when uh, when we radi uh, when we use IR to radiate a, a certain molecule, uh, this radiation is not enough to excitate the uh, electron as do other uh, spectroscopies, but is, is enough for uh, modify the vibration of the bonds. So 
that's the funny thing that it, the, that we can do with air. So the way that the the the, 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 of the vibration of the molecules is, is depends, of course, on the on the atom weight of the molecules and also of the of the bond of the angle bond. So that makes that the, each uh, functional group is, uh, has a frequency that is characteristic of, of, of it. So that's the useful information for characterization of, of, these, uh, of the molecules and of the functional group. So uh, also here in the right side, you, uh, you can see the, the main uh, uh, vibration mode that we can detect with air that are, the stretching, which is in the same plane of the bond, that would be like a like a, a hook law that will follow the hook law, and then we have also the bending vibration that are those that are uh, in the in not in the different plane of the of the bond. So here you have that it can be in the same plane or out of plane. So we have a stretching and bending vibration. And well, the, the only thing that uh, we have to know is that uh, this, uh, if, uh, if, the, if the bond doesn't have a dielectric uh, moment, we are not going to get any vibration, so any vibration mode. So we are not going to detect that. So for example, diatomic gases have a hydrogen or oxygen are not able to give a, an spectrum. So here you have that the, uh, uh, the no, I will pass to the next one. Okay, so the frequency that we are getting, but because we, we have a very different configuration, but what we are doing, what we are getting, the spectra that we are getting, the, the, the differences in the waves between the irradiation and the radiation that is uh, disturbed at our sample. So that's the difference between both of them is what we are getting. So the frequency that we are getting in the spectra depends on, and here you have the three main uh, issues, the vibrational, which is a stretching and bedding modes, and the intensity depends on how the FT energy is transferred to the molecule, which depends on the change in the dipole moment, as I mentioned, and how much is transmitted or reflected in some cases, and of course the detector. So here I will show you the main, uh, the most popular configuration because uh, as you know, this uh, spectroscopy is very common. So the most simple is the transmission, which is uh, up in the left. The, in the transmission is the first one. So just the, uh, in that, uh, in that uh, slide, the sample is the blue area and the IR radiation is the, the red arrows. So just in the transmission, which could be the more simple and, and the more old, <laughs> just we, uh, the, the IR beam goes through the, our samples, our sample. So the problem, of course, or the problem with this technique is that uh, we have to prepare a wafer of the sample. So that's not uh, possible in all the cases because we have to press the sample. And usually we have to mix the sample with another material that is transparent to the IR vibration. So to solve these kind of problems, then uh, appear the, the configuration of uh, different refractance that is the up in the, in the right light. In that case, we can just put the sample in a cell and we, in this case, we scatter the IRV. We are not transmission. We are not going through the sample and be the difference between the both uh, beans. So in the diffusion reference is very useful because and it's very popular in catalysis, but uh, because we can put a lot of different gases, so we can have uh, we can do the test in different temperature and in different gas atmosphere, but the signal is lower than in the case of transmission. So that's the main problem with diffuse refrescance. And reflected absorbent. These two, in the in this case, well, in the slide, in the figure, we have made bigger that. Uh, just to to show you how in ATR the the beam 
but the the bin is is through the um, inter inter interlayer between an, an optical surface and the and the sample that would be the the blue signal so that's really narrow okay that's very useful for liquid samples and also for for biological samples because in the other cases water is really a problem because water is going to give you a very a very strong signal that uh, usually overlaps with the other interesting signal that you want to to follow so with ATR we can solve that problem and then in the other in the in the race uh, uh, methodology you just put some monolayers of your sample of your solid sample on a mirror surface okay that's uh, useful to uh, do uh, absorption studies okay so here you can see that the bibli bibliographical map that show how uh, very popular is this technique so every year you can uh, you can see thousands of papers that done a study that uses uh, spectroscopy in chemical engineering and in other in other fields. So it's really difficult to uh, to make Jack a, a, a summarize two or three areas. As you can see, the main, the, the biggest is is to run in about nanoparticles because it's, they, they have been used in, in catalysis and in many other areas. And uh, I can give you. Uh, very useful information also in absorption because as I told you uh, with IR you can follow the, the absorption of different molecules and also look at the yellow uh, part of the map for medicine biologic biological samples drug delivery and so on so also this is uh, just an example about the most common pro molecules that are used in IR spectroscopy. Pyridine and other basic molecules are used for the characterization of both Lewis and Bronsted at its site because uh, you can follow, you can titrate uh, a surface with, by using these pro molecules and characterize the ASIC uh, sites quite well. And also uh, acetonitril and deuterated acetonitril is quite useful for the characterization of the uh, ASIC properties of zeolites. Okay, so this is, well, of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, also work that use pro molecules, not only for the acid side, but acid, uh, uh, acid and basic side are the most common studies. So now I just wanted to show you some examples about the application and the evolution of this technique. So first, I will just show you this example that I will say that this is like the past. This is an old uh, paper in which uh, and it, it's a paper of mine, okay? But it's quite old. So in this case, uh, uh, we just is with a transmission mode, you know, in a vacuum chamber. So uh, in A and B figure, you can see the uh, the spectra of, of the wafer, the spectra of our solid, of our catalyst. And in C and D, you can see the spectra of the gas phase, of course. Of, so you can monitor the solid, and then you can monitor also uh, the gas phase. So you can see the uh, species that are absorbed on of the surface of, of your, in this case, of our catalyst. So in this case, we use this study to um, because we have uh, molybdenum vanadia catalyst that were promoted with uh, uh, with tungsten, we so we could see the difference about the reactivity and that service species and so on when 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 you use the promoted uh, promoted element on the molybdenum vanadio samples, and as you can see. You could, uh, we could follow some of the oxygenates that we are formed when we were using the tungsten of our catalyst. But the main problem with this kind of uh, studies that are very common, you can see that in the 80s and in the 90s, there were a lot of studies about, this is just a one uh, to show you a typical, I would say, uh, old study with air is that we have to press the, the catalyst to prepare the wafer and we have to uh, activate. So that means that we have to heat the catalyst under vacuum. 
So under that condition, the, uh, the surface size of your catalyst may be reduced. So maybe, for example, in this case, this is a catalyst for partial oxidation. So if a catalyst is working uh, under an oxidant atmosphere at 400 degrees and I am characterized and the characterization is taken under vacuum at very high temperature. So maybe I'm looking to a different uh, thing. You know, that's why the importance that uh, Miguel Bañares told us just in the previous uh, in the previous talk about the operando methodology, so to be able to analyze the catalyst in the moment that they are working. So that's why I wanted to show you this example like a past. And now I will show you. Uh, uh, so this is just uh, some of the uncertainty. So <laughs> about what I, I, I told you that that you have to make the warfare, that, that you are not really looking in the, in the reaction condition. You can solve that problem with, uh, with drifts, but with drifts, the signal is really weak. It's, it's not, uh, and it's not possible to quantify. And you, can, uh, you have also the problem when you want to, to work on the reaction condition about water that you have to, to work with that. So many of these uh, problems have been solved. So um, I will show you now some more recent examples about the possibilities and the, and the tendency about uh, IR. So this is a nice example in which uh, we use uh, ultra rapid uh, scan IR. So in this case, we were able to get the spectra in, in less than millisecond range. So we were able to follow uh, uh, the intermediates of our reaction. So in this case, uh, uh, the software is a little bit complex because it's getting a lot of spectra just in one second. So <laughs> the file we are really, really heavy. <laughs> so in this case, what we are uh, plotting is the intensity of the signal just in one of the frequency. Of course, so once that you know what you want to look, just select some frequencies. And you can follow and to monitor the, I think I'm out of time, so I will go quickly. But so by this way, you can really uh, follow the intermediate of our reaction. For example, in this case, with, we follow the, the intermediate during the, the propane amoxidation reaction. And then, of course, uh, the future is about uh, uh, operando. This is an operando cell and it's uh, with transmission. It was developed by the uh, Marco Daturi and Miguel Bañares uh, uh, groups. And in this case, we also combined with Raman. So the, the, the cell was uh, able to analyze the I air of the catalyst, but and the reaction and the reaction condition, or is not a vacuum cell, is a real uh, reaction reaction chamber, and also at the same time we were getting also the Raman signal, and of course this is the future. Of course, looking at the uh, uh, at the catalyst and the reaction condition, and of course the combination of of more technique. Okay, so just to summarize. I would say that IR is a very, a very, very versatile tool. So I just uh, I hope just very briefly to show you the past and the future, okay? So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have time for questions. So yeah. we're a little bit uh, late on our schedule due to technical problems. Um, so I'll move on directly to the next presenter, Felipe uh, Rocha. Um, he will be presenting ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. Felipe, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to present now uh, about the UVV uh, article. It was like uh, the pioneer article of the series. And so 
basically as the highlights of this uh, of the uh, sorry Filippi, you're not screen sharing so we don't see your presentation okay sorry i thought it was on the screen sharing. Yeah. Now it's okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to present about the this article and uh, so basically, what are the highlights of this article? This technique is that it's a fast, reliable, and non-destructive analysis technique. It's inexpensive, and the equipment is very easy to use. And it performs quick measurements and the data analysis is with minimal processing. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm here showing a spectrophoton schematic for a double beam instrument. Uh, you typically there is two lamps or D2 lamps and a tungsten lamp and this is necessary because the D2 is more responsive to the UV range of the uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum while the tungsten lamp it's uh, useful for the other part that would be the visible part and uh, basically this uh, light goes through a monochromator that uh, splits the, the light and then this light passes through the uh, reference and the samples and it's detected by a photo detector. So, and how this is really measured after the light passed through the samples uh, on the factor detector, we're going to see the intensity of that light. And this intensity is going to be related uh, in the beer lambert law. And typically what we want with the technique is to find the concentration. And so moving forward, uh, what we really do on what's the theory behind of the UVV spectroscopy is basically uh, it's based on the electronic transition of the molecule, molecules absorbing the light, uh, more precisely the molecules that are covalent and uh, with unsaturations. And what is happening is basically just uh, the transition of the electrons from the molecular orbital, uh, the, the highest occupied molecular orbital of the molecules to the lowest unoccupied molecular or orbital. And this band gap, that's what uh, is responsible to the absorbance and uh, of the, the molecules. So as an example, for example, uh, here, uh, the chromophores are typically these molecules that present these unsaturated bonds. And here I'm present a phenolphthalein. That's just a simple compound that's used on daily basis for uh, all around the world. And it presents an allochromis effect that would be the change of its color based on the pH. And I'm using these as an example example to uh, show how uh, uh, it affects the, the the color of the compounds typical uh, here you can Sorry, see Felipe. Oh. Uh, seu rosto não está aparecendo na apresentação okay. Sorry. thank you <laughs> and so uh, the, uh, the chromophores, they have uh, the, these molecules, they have some groups that's called oxochromo, oxochromes, and those groups, they do not typically interact with the UVVs, but they affect the absorption. They act as electron donors for the chromophores. And what is interesting that happens here, for example, uh, with the phenolphthalein, is that when the pH is above 8.2, it gains an insaturation. And this insaturation, it uh, will increase the conjugation level of the molecules that will be now instead of having uh, separated sites of uh, conjugation, now the conjugations are around the molecule and these provide a lower band gap uh, uh, to, to the molecule that shifts the absorption to long wavelengths, making the molecule no, not more transparent to the UVV light and now it's responsive on the visible uh, area. 
So also what's important to, to see is the influence of the solvents and the absorbents. Uh, there is the interaction of the chromophores and the oxochromophores groups of the solvents together with the molecule that you want to characterize. And uh, we can see that there is shifts on the, the wavelength and it, the increase or decrease on the absorbance based on what molecule you are analyzing here when we are seeing the methylene blue absorbance. And what's interesting to see, for example, some uh, solvents as water and uh, alcohols, they are very suitable for the technique because they are transparent to the UVVs radiation, but other solvents as DMSO or acetone, they have uh, some response at lower uh, UVVs uh, uh, wavelengths, for example, 320, 280 nanometers. So you have to account to these uh, to see if it's not going to overlap on the response of the molecule that you are trying to measure. So then we did the bibliometric map of the UVVs, uh, accounts the 100 key words of the 10,000 most cited articles that mention the UVVs. And uh, uh, not uh, surprisingly, uh, nanoparticle is the most studied field, as you can see by the difference of the size of the, the circles. And we identified four different groups uh, that were more prominent, that area in red would be the photocatalyst and water treatment. And uh, in blue, we are seeing the nanoparticles and nanostructures. In green, we are seeing crystal complex derivatives. And in yellow, uh, it's still nanoparticles, but focus on gold and silver nanoparticles and antibacterial applications. So this is just some examples of the um, a lot of application that uh, UVVs has. And for example, for as reaction rate, we can measure the degradation as sex, the mixing of compounds. We can see the interaction of encapsulation and controlled release. We can couple UVVs with other techniques as HPLC and max spectroscopy. Uh, we can see polymers and uh, to see emulsions and impregnation or functionalization and for example, nanoparticle size. So here, UVVs is not only for liquid analysis. There is other, uh, other techniques that use UVVs as diffuse reflectance spectroscopy that's typically suitable for solids, more specific for founders, where it's uh, using integrating the sphere that measure the reflections of your samples. And with that, we can uh, we see the reflection of the sample related to the refraction of a standard, and the is calculated a reflection of an infinite uh, thickness, uh, thickened uh, sample. And from this, we also can estimate semi the semiconductor band gaps using the Schuster Kubelka Monk function that's derivated from that equation. And here I'm presenting on this graph one. Uh, application where the oxide coordination resolution uh, is given based of the interaction of the, the IACAC with titanium. And so the titanium coordination is being controlled by the in situ ACA, ACA production, where here we can see on black that uh, the, on the line in black, that uh, there is a response of 350 nanometers that correspond to the octahedrically coordinated titanium, uh, while when there is the presence of the ACA, ACA this, uh, this uh, response is not present anymore. And now we have just the correspond uh, correspondence at 300, 220 nanometers, and that's corresponded to the tetrahedrally coordinated titanium. So one of the uh, uncertainties uh, of this technique would be related with the high concentrations of the compounds, where the compounds is going to be deviating from uh, beers lambert's law because uh, they start typically to interact with each other, forming dimers. And so we have, uh, as you can see here on this graph, that the blue would be the expected absorbance and uh, in the red is the absorbance that's measured. And what we can see that uh, we have some recommendations for that and to typically use concentrations below one more per, one more per liter to keep uh, the, keeping the absorbance peak under one arbitrary unit of uh, measurement and reduce the slit to minimize the stray light. 
uh, we can also verify the sample oxygen sensitivity and the compounds that have the high molar absorptivity, uh, uh, they are more sensitive. And so you have to pay attention more to those characteristics for this kind of compounds. And also something that's typically uh, for, forgotten uh, for, uh, from, from the analysis the temperature effect as the temperature typically dilates the solvent and then you have to account a correction for the thermal expansion of the solvent. And even more important that uh, this temperature will alter the chromophore hydration level. So as a detection limits of the technique, uh, there is a difference uh, in between some noise and the sample uh, signal. Ideally, we would need to measure the noise at our wavelengths, but it's very time consuming. And so, and the signal to noise ratio should be above three uh, of value and uh, measure single species to avoid um, mismatch of results. But in practical, uh, we measure the baseline flatness. And so we, we account to a bigger error between the signal and the, the baseline noise difference. And uh, the signal to noise ratio is acceptable when it's already above two. And uh, there is the interference on the results by multiple species present on the medium. And as a perspective of the technique would be uh, it's of end future development is very interesting the uh, approaches that we use operand model on real conditions, because uh, and it can also allow to couple with multiple uh, probes of UVVs we can measure in different areas of the reactor for a better spatial resolution of the technique. And we can also couple with other techniques, as we can see here on this example, that's a reactor, a uh, quartz plug flow reactor, where we are coupling the UVVs. And there is an APR cavity for measurements, our Hammond laser, and the products of the, the, uh, the catalyst process is being analyzed by a GC. And uh, so, as a conclusion, uh, the UVV is one of the simplest and most effective analytical techniques. It's an effective tool to assess reaction kinetics and is applied extensively in industrial and research laboratories. And it is able to perform both quantitative and qualitative analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felipe, for your presentation. Um, we still don't have time for questions, unfortunately, but please, uh, attendees, uh, feel free to contact uh, Paledi Congre in the chat and ask your questions. So the next speaker is Mario Ferreiro Gonzalez, and he will be presenting uh, X-ray fluorescence. Uh, Excuse me, Oui. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to present the X ray fluorescence for chemical analysis. Um, well, this technique is. It's a, it's a spectrometric analytical technique that uses X-rays to analyze the basic elementary components of matter. So it doesn't analyze compounds, it's just a basic element. It's a non-destructive technique, so you can you don't lose your sample. It can be used with liquids, polar, uh, solids, like basically any state of the matter, although gases are kind of difficult. It can detect most of the elements Light elements are very difficult because uh, oxygen, nitrogen is in the atmosphere, so it's difficult to separate from your sample. 
but like heavy element until uranium it's easily detected heavier than uranium it become more difficult but well there is not that many so it's okay so it's a very fast technique like um, between seconds and minutes depends on your or your sample or your preparation or the accuracy you want the detail that you want uh, you have like a um, hand XRF analyzer that they can perform an, uh, an analysis in a few seconds or more uh, complex analyzer that can take like 30 minutes and you will get like a very precise measurement of your sample. So what is XRF? So XRF is based on um, effect that happen when you irradiate as element with X-rays with enough energy, you will um, eject an electron from the inner core of the of the atom and that uh, empty space it has to be filled to keep the balance of the element so an electron from outer uh, seal other orbital it will it will drop down and then it will release energy to like because the different energy and it's this energy is specific of its element and it's a it's transition so you measure that energy emitted and then you can know which element is it Obviously, this is more complicated because you will have a wide um, range of energies and X-rays. So you will have effects from Rayland scatter radiation or Compton scatter radiation. So Rayland scatter radiation, it's uh, basically a elastic scattering. So it's the same X-rays and energy that is, it, the energy is not uh, absorbed by the electron and it's uh, bouncing back. And the Copton is when you give some part of the energy to the electron or the atom and you get the rest in the X-ray, but it's not enough to remove the electron. So well, once you get the, the fluorescent X-ray energy, which is the, the characteristic energy, you have to detect it. And then there's a few ways to do that. So well, here you, you have the the different transitions that are possible for a, like a small atom. And as you can see, it depends on where you, where you remove the electron in the inner core and where the electron from the other cells uh, came down, you have different transitions that can be from KL and N, which is like a spectrometric um, nomenclature, but it's like, um, so you will have different transitions and depending it's alpha, beta, or, uh, lambda, it will change the energies and different, and it's again it's a specific for each atom, so you can measure them and then you can know which one are you dealing with. So to create the X rays, what well, basically what we do is you have a filament and then you have a chamber, and then you apply a high voltage in the filament in the chamber with an anode, so you produce the electrons and then you make those electrons go against the anode and then when the electron hits the anode uh, because the electron just stops suddenly you create a uh, very loud radiation which is the energy produced for the energy the kinetic energy from the electron converted into x-ray photons okay this is very interesting because when you use a, an anode usually it's gallium or like a heavy element the energy produced for this effect is very constant and it's very standard like you will have like a, a gauss shape distribution but it's always the same so it's a constant source of energy to measure your so there's different ways to do this you can do it with um like 90 degrees um, application or you can do it in a target transmission which is it's more like you can direct the radiation without any bouncing and then you can apply some uh, beryllium windows to filter the sample, to filter the radiation and get more like a clear uh, incoming radiation, which will help you later to, when you want to measure the sample because you will have less noise and things. So there is other way that it can help you to, to improve your, your measurement. And so basically you get like a secondary uh, target and that secondary target will give you like an incoming a radiation that is more specific for what you want. So you use against the fluorescence target, you, you have an element that you know, and then you will induce a fluorescence. So you will use the fluorescent X-rays 
to measure your sample. So you have a very unique and specific X-ray photons to measure your sample, which depending on your application, it can be helpful because you can uh, reduce the noise and the, it can be very element specific. Uh, Barcap targets is more or less the same idea, but you don't have any, you don't have any fluorescent or you have lower like the radiation. And then you have a black target, which is like a prism, like a, it's usually is a prism, a crystal that you filter all the radiation, all the wetlands that you don't want, and you keep only the ones you want. So you irradiate your sample with a specific uh, energy or specific wetland. So, well, in this kind of measurement, we use kind of indistinctively a uh, wavelength energy because they are related also frequency, like, you know, like a higher energy, higher, a uh, lower frequency. And so, anyways, so um, we had basically two main types of uh, X-ray detector. So the ones that they measure energy will be energy dispersive system. And the one that measure the wavelength would be wavelength dispersive system. So the most common and the most used are the energy dispersive systems because are easier, are cheaper to produce, and they they are more reliable. Uh, wavelength dispersive systems are way more uh, sensitive. They are better, but they are more complicated and more expensive. So the energy dispersive system well, measure the energy of the incoming radiation. The detector use a dispersion to separate the the all all the X-ray uh, from the sample that you have, all the noise, all the fluorescent, and all the uh, benchmark and rating from Compton to get the elements separated from each element. So you can measure the radiation from the fluorescent. And well, they have simpler designer and are better for typically for heavier elements. They are not that good for lighter elements because they have less uh, fluorescent. So the wavelength dispersive systems use a crystal, usually have a multi-channel analytical system. They are more complicated, um, but they basically separate the different frequencies, the simple uh, wavelength, and then you get like a, a more precise measurement. Um, it's good for all elements. Uh, it's better for light elements and heavy elements. In the middle, it's a bit lower, but it's also very good. And then you can measure from beryllium to uranium, uh, but you have a moving part and very critical part that it can be damaged and make it more difficult. And it's difficult to make it smaller rather than the energy dispersion. Okay, so this is a typical spectrum for an X-ray analytical. And as you see, you have peaks and then you have the energy, which will define you the, your element. And then you have the key A, key B, which is the transition of the electron that is also specific of each element. The good thing of this is like you can measure the element and you can measure the, the amount the element you have like by combining the energy, which will say you which element you have and the intensity, which is the count, you can know how many atoms you have in a sample in PPM usually. So you can go from zero to PPM to 100% of the sample. So the applications, X-ray uh, fluorescence is not that used in analytical labs. I don't, it's not that common as like DC or FDIR or other techniques. And it's very used in industry, usually for uh, quality controls and things like that. But as you can see, you, it's kind of used everywhere, um, especially with metals, usually um, absorption, spectrometry. But yeah, it doesn't have like a specific field where you can use it. You can use it everywhere where you want to check yeah, your elemental composition and those things. So the general applications, there, there will be mining, metallurgical, petrochemicals, like plastic and polymers, food, environment, like everywhere you want to analyze uh, elemental content. Like in food, you can analyze the iron content, salt content, uh, you can look for like pollutants in mining. It's good for to analyze the the drill uh, samples. You can analyze the ore, uh, anything that can give you any information. It can be used even in paleontology, like in metallurgical. It's commonly used to check if your your alloys are well done, the quality, like quality controls, 
petrochemicals to look for sulfur and other metals that can be um, a problem in your products, in your oil or in your lubricants and so on. Depends what you need. Uh, well, so the, um, the answer time and the station limit, it's uh, obviously dependent on your equipment and then your sample preparation and your calibration. Usually for calibration, you use a standard like those one in the picture. Um, you can buy as well, and they are like pretty standard as it should be. Uh, the instrument has a great uh, influence in your measurement because part of the of the answer time you get in a sample came from all the statistical background of the XRF and the sources. So you need to have a good software and a good uh, database to be able to remove or to reduce this, uh, this answer time. But if you do it like, a, it's usually easy to do it and then you can get range from one PPN 100% easily go to PPN even with a uh, wavelength x-ray F, you need to do a good sample preparation and use like a good calibration to make sure that you can detect especially you have a complex and very like with a lot of elements and different or more like many elements in low concentration and you want to separate it you will need to work more with that but. so the accuracy it will depend on the quality of your reference materials, but nowadays it's pretty standard, it's not difficult. Your calibration procedure, it must be the right. It also will depend on your element, your machine, but it shouldn't be that difficult. And the duration of the measurement. Again, that's something that you can change easily. And obviously, as you increase, if you increase the time of the measurement, you will improve your, your accuracy because you will have more data and then you will reduce this systematic error and your statistical error, which is also the precision is basically due to the statistical nature of the of the of this quantum analysis, let's say. So it's related to the X-ray tube emission, the emission absorption process, on the transition, and the detection process of the of the detector. So those statistical um, problems in precision usually are tracked by the instrument, by informatics, like software and things like that. And nowadays are very like almost removed, but then you need to be careful with that. And so this will be like a, a typical example. On the left, you can see my, it's an analysis of one plastic I'm working with using um, Brooker's one titan. It's a an, um, X-ray, like a portable X-ray that I can do this analysis in less than 30 seconds. And then you can see the, well, the, the components in a typical plastic from a electronic waste. So you can see you have a lot of bromine because they fire retardant, and then you have calcium, you have titanium, you have other, but usually it's because the additives and the colorants and stuff. And this is like, you can see the other columns are for the, you can set it for the regulation, but this is not interesting here. And then you can see the, the error. So the error usually is not that high. It's like, I check this, this exam machine with, the, with my value, with my standards, and the precision for bromine is very high when it's higher concentration. It gets less uh, precise when you go to low concentration. So then is when this and XRF is not that good. And then you should use like a proper machine that we have in the lab that is better. And then you use longer times and better calibration. So just to summarize, it's a very a versatile and fast element analysis. It only detects elements, no compounds or any kind of uh, bone or molecules like FTR or other techniques. Um, there is many like the manufacturers they give you many uh, options to combine different detectors on different emitters there is some that they use even gamma rays and many ways to excite the the fluorescence and if you have a very specific application it can be done for your application but in general you can have like an xrf and analyze all the samples you want you just need to do a small sample preparation it's not destructive, so you can use reuse your sample for other analysis. 
And really, you just need to create like a disk or something homogeneous, and it won't take that much difficult. Um, yeah, so I think that will summarize everything. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. Uh, I know a lot of people would like to ask questions, so we're very behind on the schedule. So I will leave the questions for the coffee break. So we're going to leave the the meeting open, and you can ask all the questions to the presenters. Uh, so moving on to the next uh, speaker, please uh, uh, welcome uh, Professor Anderson Gomez. I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. Uh, he will be presenting fluorescence emission spectroscopy. Okay. Um, one moment, please. Yes, sure. Just in a moment, I have a little problem with my system. Okay, um, first I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to participate in this event, talk about the work that was published in the Canadian Journal of Camp Engineer in collaboration with Professor Claudio Felipe and Professor Gregory. Uh, I'm sorry, we're hearing a little bit of echo, so um, do you have other microphones? Okay, I will turn off the audio. It's better? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, we're not able to hear anything now. Uh, this is a recording. Would it be possible to um, screen share the presentation and present live? Okay, uh, just a moment, please. Uh, if you prefer, we can move on to the next speaker and uh, we can uh, let you present at the end. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, can you please stop the screen sharing? Thank you very much. Okay, please welcome the next speaker, Emelinda Falletta. Um, she will be uh, presenting mass power spectroscopy. Emelinda? Yeah, 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 good morning. Okay. I try to share my screen. Okay, thank you. Do you see my, my screen? Yeah? Uh, yes, perfect. Okay. 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 Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to be part of this symposium. The topic of my talk focused on mass Bauer spectroscopy. And this work has been uh, recently published on the Canadian Journal of Chemical Engineering in collaboration with Professor Claudia Bianchi and Dr. Rita Dialabi of the Department of Chemistry of the University of Milan with Dr. Alessandro Ponti of the National Research Council of Milan and Professor Gregory Passens of the Department of Chemical Engineering of the Polytechnic of Montreal. Sorry, I have a problem to change the slide. I try to share again my screen. Okay. In the present talk, I'll introduce the theory behind this spectroscopy. I'll show some uh, traditional applications of the technique and an example of innovative uh, application. And finally, I'll spend a few words on the uncertainty and new perspectives for this type of uh, technique. In 1957, Rudolf uh, Masbauer was a promising PhD student at the Technical University in Munich and at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg in the lab of Professor Leibniz when he discovered the recoilless nuclear resonance absorption of gamma radiation working on iridium-191. Generally, we know that uh, when an atom emits photons, it undergoes a recoil absorbing part of the energy from the photons. And this means that in these conditions, uh, the atom is not able to resonate with another similar atom. Most Bauer observed that if the material has a crystalline structure able to distribute the recoil over many atoms, it reduces the energy loss of the gamma photons, and this effect was called Most Bauer effect. And very soon it became the principle of a new spectroscopy called Most Bauer spectroscopy that find applications in many fields, ranges from biophysics, biology, medicine, and so on and so on forth. By this spectroscopy, it's possible to uh, obtain information on electric structure, magnetic behavior, phase transition, molecular symmetry, and bonding properties of materials having active nuclides. But it's important also to point out that this technique is not destructive and uh, it, uh, it is quantitative in terms of that it gives information about the amount of uh, active nuclides inside the materials thanks to hyperfine interactions that are interactions between the nucleus and the neighboring electrons, mainly electrons in the or S orbitals. Mosbauer effect is not so different from acoustic resonance between two tuning forks with the same frequency. Also here, in the case of Mosbauer effect, we have a sender that is a source of gamma rays and an adsorber that is able to uh, absorb the uh, gamma rays produced by the source. This means that a nucleus with N neutrons and Z protons in the excited energy states EE is able to emit a photon gamma rays that another nucleus, a similar nucleus, having the same number of neutrons and protons in its ground states EG, absorb. And as a consequence, this nucleus passes from the ground state EG to the excited stage EG and is able to emit again these photons and so on and so on forth. Cobalt 57 is an excellent gamma radiation source for Mosbauer spectrometry, and this nucleus can decay by capturing an electron, leading to iron 57 in the excited states with nuclear spin quantum number I, 5 by 2. 
these uh, uh, atoms, the nucleus, uh, can decay to the uh, ground states uh, EI equal to one by two directly, or through an intermediate level, this one, and uh, this transition causes the production of gamma rays that can be absorbed by another similar nucleus. Resonance absorption happens only when the emission and absorption lines overlap. In this slide, you find in red the most bioreactive elements of the periodic table, and you can see among all these elements, only 20 isotopes have a nuclear excited state that is long enough or a transition energy that is high enough to be used for, for this kind of application. However, despite this, for the analysis of materials that don't have most bioreactive nucleus, alternative solution can be found. For example, by doping these materials with small amounts of active nuclides that in general are atoms or nucleus of iron 57. As you can see here on the left of the screen, a typical Mosbauer spectrum consists of a plot of relative energy transmission versus velocity of the source, source velocity. In fact, if the emitter and the absorber have the same local environment, the Mosbauer spectrum is a single peak, as you can see here. The point is that in reality, this never happens because the emitter and the absorber have different local environment leading to large changes in absorbance. And the point is that in order to bring in resonance, the emitter and the absorber is necessary to change the gamma rays energy. And in order to do this, we have to move the source. In fact, in this scheme, you see that the source is uh, connected with a velocity drive and the uh, value that you see here in the X axis of the mass power spectrum is the velocity of this source. By Mosbauer spectrometry, three main types of uh, nuclear interactions can be observed. These are isomer, sh isomer shift, electrical double splitting, magnetic Zeeman splitting. Isomer shift is related to the Coulomb interactions between protons in the nucleus and the neighboring electrons. And as I told before, this interaction causes a change in the nuclear energy levels. And in order to bring in resonance, the emitter and the absorbers, the source has to be moved, causing a shift of the signal, this delta shift. This type of uh, hyperfan interaction gives information on the oxidation states of the nucleus, its spin states, its bonding properties, and so on. And here, for example, you find schematized the typical value of the delta of shift, the isomer shift, for different compounds containing iron in different oxidation states with different uh, um, spin, spin state. The electric quadruple splitting is related to the presence of electric quadruple moment at to a heterogeneous electric field around the nucleus. And this type of interaction causes a split of the nuclear energy into two, two sublevels. This kind of interactions give information about the oxidation states, spin states, size, in particular site symmetry. As you can see here, for example, the uh, iron-based compound in red has a symmetric distribution of the ligands around the, the, the iron nucleus. And for this reason, this type of compound doesn't show electric quadruple splitting. On the contrary, in these two other cases, this type of compounds have a different distribution of ligands around the nucleus, uh, the, the, the middle of the, of the compounds. And for it, this asymmetry causes the production of electric quadruple splitting. Finally, the magnetic Zeeman splitting occurs when the nuclear states show a magnetic dipole moment and when a magnetic field is present. And this also in this case, we have a splitting of the uh, nuclear energy. And in this case, uh, we obtain information about the magnetic properties of these materials, of the materials. Passing to the application, it's clear this, that this type of, um, of technique find application in particular in, uh, in the characterization of uh, materials containing a magnetic cores, in particular magnetic nanoparticles. It is generally uh, coupled with other type of spectroscopy, in particular XRD, Raman, and so on. It is particularly useful for the uh, definition of crystal structures of different compounds. 
Here you find a list of the main applications that this technique um, find, in particular in the industrial sector, material characterization and so on. Now we will talk about the two traditional applications, mineral identification and corrosion studies. And we will show uh, an innovative application. In fact, a miniaturization of uh, a most power spectrometer was included on the twin Mars exploration rovers, the spirit and the opportunity to explore the planet Mars. Concerning mineral identifications, Mosbauer is a convenient and non-destructive technique very useful to identify traces of iron species in mineral. In fact, Mosbauer spectroscopy produces a fingerprint of each material. It is particularly used for the characterization of green rust that is a mixture of iron-based and stable hydroxy salt. By this technique, exploiting the information that we can obtain from the hyperfine interactions, it's possible to distinguish a different iron-based salt also plainly, for example, for in, uh, environment conditions, in particular working on the temperature, uh, operating temperature that we use. Corrosion phenomena represents a huge problem in industrial chemistry because corrosion products are mainly uh, iron oxides or iron oxy uh, or hydroxides. The use of Mosbauer spectroscopy is particularly convenient also in this case. And this technique is able to detect and quantify very small dispersed particles in each material, where generally the other technique fail. Sometimes, Depending on the experimental conditions, some of the different types of iron oxides that we can have in the same materials can be distinguished, as I told before, plain, for example, in the different temperature, uh, operating temperature that we can use. In this manner, we can play on the phase transition and crystal symmetry of the, of the compounds. Finally, as I told you, a miniaturization of uh, Mosbauer spectrometer was sent to Mars to detect traces of water, and it was able to record the Mosbauer spectrum of this sol, that is a ferric sulfate hydroxide, that is called yarosite, that is the best evidence of water on the planet. And this is amazing because the discovery paved the way to other fruitful investigations. The accuracy of uh, Mosbauer spectroscopy uh, is related to three main sources of uncertainty. In fact, the main contribution is that related to the fitting of Mosbauer spectra, but we have also errors associated to the calibration, thermal interferences, and pre pre um, errors related to the reading of the background. Among all these errors, the greatest, the greatest contribution to the uncertainty is related to the complexity of the Mosbauer spectra, but also the temperature interference uh, play, um, plays an important role. Although the uncertainty values are uh, reported to be within 0 0.005 and 0 0.01 millimeter per second, it's clear that it is related to several factors and also to the ability of to the operator. Even though that, uh, so far Mosbauer spectroscopy has been a purely used technique, the possibility to exploit a synchrotron radiation could, could open new perspectives in this field. And despite its limitation and the, the intrinsic problems related to the um, fitting of the Mosbauer spectra, this technique could support the other traditional techniques in several sectors in order to reach a fine characterization of new materials, as well as to investigate new processes and new scenarios. Here you find summarized some conclusions of this talk, but before to conclude, I'd like to thank all the authors that contributed to this work and you for the kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, is uh, Professor Gomez uh, ready? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. I'm... Uh, we see the second screen. Second? Yeah, we see the second screen with the text box. We don't see the full presentation. Okay. Uh, 
you typically have an option to swap screens. Yeah. Typically shows up when you are presenting and you have the two options and one of them you will have like a little icon to swap. Okay. Um, that one. Uh, I'm try um, Well, in the meantime, if anybody has questions for previous speakers, so please go ahead. Uh, Professor Gomez, we'll, we will have to start presenting, we'll start the second uh, session of the morning in uh, 10 minutes. So if you're not able to present now, we can move you to the end of the afternoon. So I will contact you via email and I will send you uh, all the details. So for all the, all the attendees here, um, you can take a 10 minutes uh, coffee break and then uh, we'll start again uh, with the new session in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you everyone. Okay. Um, yes, so just starting with my presentation, um, XPS is, uh, when I say just starting for me, it's my going back to my previous and probably first research, my life when I was at university. Because why, when I entered at the University of Milan in, in uh, 1992, um, I have, uh, I mean, I was very lucky, and uh, a first XPS was installed in the, my laboratory, and so I was the first student that uh, was the, let's say, the opportunity to work on uh, on this technique. It was very, very nice. Uh, now I will ask to to introduce the the spectroscopy. And also to remind you uh, the paper that we wrote uh, in 2019 with, uh, with uh, Federico and Daria, of course, 
And uh, it's just to summarize what are the very important points on uh, these techniques. First of all, it's, it's nice because it's a surface analysis, so we can check carefully what is the composition of the surface on solid materials. Uh, it is possible to identify the elemental composition, try to understand the eventual empiric empirical formula, to make some evaluation on the chemical state of the atoms that are present on the surface of a solid, and uh, in general to have an idea about the electronic state, state of this element. Um, the machine, the instrumentation is working on the kinetic energy of the electrons that are escaping from the material surface, but at the end uh, we have a final uh, result uh, that is uh, expressed as uh, binding energy. Now we will check it and we will see it all together. What are the important point of uh, XPS? Uh, XPS, as I mentioned, identifies chemical species and quantify their content. Uh, and sometimes, and I will show you some examples, uh, it is possible also to have some, um, some assumptions about eventual interactions between uh, surface species. Um, it, here it's a report that is minimally destructive, destructive in, in theory, but in general, you can uh, reuse uh, your sample after the analysis without any problem. Uh, it's sensitive to a depth between one to two, maximum 10 nanometers. In general, depends uh, on the angles uh, at which the, the beams uh, will, uh, will enter inside uh, uh, the sample. Sometimes it's possible to have also some instrumentation that is, uh, has a, a depth that is only in the range of Armstrong. The elemental sensitivity is not so high, however, is in the order of uh, 0.1 atomic percentage. Uh, the main problem is that uh, it is necessary to make this uh, analysis in ultra high vacuum. Uh, and of course, this means that you have to work with this very stable samples from the pressure point of view. Uh, measurement times uh, can vary between uh, uh, some minutes uh, and I mean, in some particular cases, you can also work with hours depending on what is the final goal that you want to, to uh, succeed. It's a quite old uh, technique now. It is more or less 50, 50 years ago. Now we have, uh, of course, new spectrometers and uh, new detectors. Uh, we can, uh, some, in some cases, uh, make some different photon beams uh, with variable size. And of course, in this case, we can reduce uh, the analysis time and increase uh, the spatial resolution. Here, just to show you what is uh, at the basis of, of this uh, technique. So we have just a solid surface electron emission. Uh, the technique is working just with the X-ray. They are called soft X-ray, they're not so hard like the uh, classical uh, X-ray diffraction. So they are very soft X-ray that can penetrate only for some atomic layer. And this is the why, I mean, it's a surface technique and not it's a bulk one. Uh, this means that we have information about the first two maximum three layers. And so we can have a real information about the surface composition of one uh, material. Here we can see once more the photoelectric effect. So um, we have, of course, the possibility to, uh, when I say, uh, emit photoelectrons that comes from the core of our, uh, of our element. Uh, usually we can uh, have electron that comes from the 1s or 2s or 2p or 3d depends of course uh, of the uh, bands of the uh, core bands of our uh, element on the contrary we don't have any kind of information about the valence band in this case uh, there is a, a, a when I say a, a particular technique, it's not, not called XPS, but UPS. And in this case, you can have information just on the valence band of one uh, element on one, uh, in this case, a compound. So I would like just to make you 
a, a, an example, a real example, and I want to, to use uh, uh, one paper of ours that was published uh, this year uh, with the help of some, uh, some of my uh, friends, uh, Federico and Alma and Ari, of course. Um, here it's, a, a, I mean, the preparation of particular uh, photo catalysts. In this case, uh, the, this photo catalyst comes from bismuth oxal, uh, oxalides. And uh, in uh, our laboratory, they are, they are then used uh, to degrade the NOx uh, uh, under visible light. The aim of this experimentation was to test, uh, and, and first of all, to prepare these materials. And as you can see from the also uh, scanning electron microscope point of view, that these materials were very different from the morphology point of view. Uh, they were prepared changing the chloride source uh, uh, and uh, we have a nominal percentage of metallic bismuth. So what uh, we can access? So we can access that we need to have, uh, as I mentioned, a surface uh, um, uh, analysis uh, just to check the composition. This is what we can have from the so-called survey point of view. This is just literature. So this, uh, this uh, in particular, this spectra comes from a handbook. This is just to make you understand what is the first uh, information that you can have. A spectrum like this, uh, as I mentioned, the name is survey. And from this spectrum, you can have information about the main uh, peaks that comes from, as I mentioned before, the core electrons that are excited and that are captured from, from the instrumentation. Here, for example, is a, a titanium dioxide, and uh, you can see, for example, here the two peak, the two P, uh, there are, of course, two P, three, three and a half, and one and a half, the uh, electron that, that comes from the uh, core 2s and the one that comes from 3p and 3s. So this is a sort of fingerprint. I mean every element has its own particular pattern and from this, from the binding energy, you can recognize which kind of element you are investigated. But very important, as I mentioned, is not more is not only this part, but I mean what you can do in details. So going in particular into the 2p region. So for the titanium dioxide, we are uh, around 460 electron volt. You can uh, have a particular analysis. And in this case, investigating exactly the binding energy at which uh, these two peaks uh, uh, are present in the spectrum, you can recognize which kind of titanium you have. In this case, for example, titanium dioxide. In the uh, small table that you can have here, you can see the difference between uh, the peak in, in case of a titanium metal titanium, in the case of titanium connected with borom, with nitrogen, with chlorine, with oxygen, as I mentioned before, for example, uh, barium titanate, cal calcium titanate, and so on and so forth. So you can see how it is quite easy to recognize uh, from the uh, ele ele elemental point of view, uh, what is the position of titanium in this case in your sample? So uh, what is the main part? Of course, depends on the electronegativity of your uh, partner, element partner. In the case, for example, of chlorine, you can see that the titanium binding energy uh, goes at very high binding energies uh, compared to the, for example, titanium oxide, where we have 450, 455 uh, against the 458, 59. So this is the, I mean, the logical that is at the base of uh, XPS. Now, going back once more to our, as I mentioned, previous examples. So in the case of our uh, photocatalyst, uh, we have the bismuth, as I mentioned, and uh, our opinion that probably with the presence of chlorine, we have the possibility to have several bismuth uh, at the surface of our samples. And in fact, uh, going in details uh, to our uh, bismuth uh, peaks, uh, in this case, uh, it's just one of the samples that we um, uh, investigated. We can see that uh, from the overall of the spectrum, it is possible to recognize in this case two different species. One is bismuth 3, 
and the other one is bismuth zero. And probably it is only bismuth zero that is our active part in our photocatalyst. Moreover, as I mentioned, we can have an idea about the surface percentage of bismuth at the top of the surface of our samples. Just remember, of course, that uh, it is just uh, the surface that is working in the case of a photocatalyst. So what is present in the bulk, of course, uh, is a species that uh, will not work uh, from the photocatalytic point of view. So it's interesting in this case to see that changing the chlorine source, for example, just for samples, here you can see the uh, atomic bismuth at the surface is uh, completely uh, different changing from six to 22, so very different uh, concentration uh, on the top of the material. And once more, it's uh, very important for, now, for us, uh, the percentage of bismuth zero. In fact, uh, we found also a correlation between uh, the fraction of bismuth, of metallic bismuth uh, uh, that we recognize from XPS, uh, uh, well, I mean, it was a correlation with the uh, NOx conversion that we have in our photoreactors after three, uh, three hours of test. So you can see a, an interesting correlation between, as I mentioned, the amount of uh, bismuth, metallic bismuth and the uh, NOx conversion. Um, if you check uh, on the website on Google, as I mean, uh, about the uh, bibliometric map, uh, you will find several, several articles working and using XPS. It's now, it's a technique that you use uh, in several characterization when you have a solid material. And uh, you can identify in general five uh, main clusters. The first one that is connected with nanoparticles, thin films and surfaces. Of course, a very big chapter connected with catalysis oxidation, reduction, stability, uh, and oxides in general, uh, a part connected with nanocomposites, graphene, graphite, and electrochemistry, a main part uh, uh, especially used, uh, I mean, uh, in, in the present uh, research and photocatalysis, and uh, one part connected with uh, wastewater, water purification, aqueous solution, and adsorption. Here you can see what is uh, the bibliometric, uh, I mean, uh, characterization that was made uh, by uh, by us uh, and professor, in particular by Professor Prescience. And you can see, I mean, uh, what is the uh, interesting uh, use of these techniques in several, several parts of uh, our, I mean, uh, uh, solid application or characterization in general. Now, uh, just to close my presentation, I would like to stress, uh, I mean, uh, uh, very important conclusion. So first of all, it's a very useful techniques to verify uh, the surface composition of a solid material. Uh, in many, many cases, the surface composition is very far from the bulk composition. And as I mentioned before, the surface is what is really working from a catalytic point of view. But in general, the surface is the part that is working and that is interfa the interface with, uh, with water, with air, and so on. It's probably a unique technique uh, able to investigate the oxidation state of element atoms, we can say, that are present at the surface of a solid material. It's unique because no other techniques can do this. And uh, in many cases, uh, we are speaking about solid oxidation state. Uh, as I mentioned you before, when I make the example of titanium, uh, in case uh, you can make some also assumption about the possible element that is connected with uh, uh, your uh, main element. We spoke about uh, oxide or we speak, spoke about chlorine, for example, and you can check that in all cases, uh, the difference in the binding energy is so high that you can have an interesting conclusion about what is present uh, on your surface. Very important, the point that you can recover your sample at the end of the measurements. So especially if you have a solid sample or you can prepare your material in very few quantity and you want to recover it, you can, you can do it without any problems. Uh, the only two problems are connected with the uh, vacuum. So if the, your sample is uh, vacuum sensible, 
uh, or sensitive, or in the case, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the ray, the X-ray is uh, warming a little bit your sample. The samples can reach uh, 50, 60 degrees C. So in case uh, you have a sample that is, uh, I mean, have a problem of thermal stability, just thinking about particular kind of polymers, just only in this case, uh, I mean, uh, the, the technique uh, can destroy your, your sample. And of course, very important because you can use uh, without any problem uh, with powdered samples uh, and also with, of course, pieces. The size of the piece that you can uh, introduce inside your main chamber depends only about the main chamber size. So in general, you can use uh, pieces that are um, centimeters with a depth of once more a couple of centimeters. So you can introduce inside the, the chamber a very important piece. Okay, so thank you for your, uh, I mean, for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, of course, uh, I'm here. Dalma, a te. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, we have time for a quick question. Uh, in Palais de Congrès, they have, uh, someone has a question. One, one hand. Uh, yes, Ola Taylor, go ahead. Yeah, I, I may have missed this in the presentation, but um, how thick does the sample need to be for these kinds of methods? Um, I'm asking because my lab, we, we use a slightly different, also x-ray based type of analysis um, for samples where we've taken a gas and passed it through a filter, and then we analyze what's impacted on the filter. I'm just curious about this, your method that you've presented here. Yeah, there are no problem about thickness. I mean, the thickness depends on, as I mentioned, the main chamber. So, I mean, you can enter inside the, the main chamber even with a very important piece from the size point of view. About the, on the contrary, the depth of the, um, of the measurement. In this case, uh, as I mentioned, depends on the angle at which the, the beam ray is uh, reaching your samples. However, from the standard, uh, and commercial technique and uh, so instrumentations, you can uh, uh, have a, a depth of analysis that is around 50 Armstrong, more or less, maximum one nanometer. Uh, so this is the depth of the analysis that you can reach with this kind of techniques. So very, very thin, as I mentioned, so very far from the traditional, as I mentioned, XRD. All right, thank so you. Very surface analysis, so welcome. So we have a question from uh, Balin. Oh, no, you don't? Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, Professor Soares, would you like to introduce the next speaker? Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, yes, yes, give me a minute here. Okay, so, um, um, well, my name is Joe Soares. I'm also the editor of the Canadian Journal of Chemical Engineering. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here helping uh, sharing this session. Um, all those papers uh, have been published or will be published in the journal and it's been a very successful series indeed. So it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, listen to those talks. I'd like to introduce the, our next speaker, um, Noshin Sadat from, the, uh, from Polytechnic Montreal and uh, talking about uh, TGA, thermograph uh, thermogravimetric analysis. Machine, uh, the uh, floor is yours. You can remove your mask, machine, while you present. Um, I think your microphone is off, machine. Right. Oh, there you go. It's good now. Yeah, okay. we can see, I can see your slides here. Okay. Perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear and see me well? That's perfect. Yes, yes. Okay, super. Today I'm going to talk about thermogravimetric analysis. It's a really easy and cheap method. Probably many of you have used it before or many times. Uh, it's a technique to monitor mass change of a sample while heating up, it's heating it up in a furnace. 
but there are some details about TGA that if you don't know it, you might end up making big mistake in doing uh, analyzing your sample. To give you a bad general background idea of the TGA, based, based on Web of Science, uh, around 11,000 papers has uh, mentioned TGA between 2016 and 17. Among uh, these papers, 1,100 of these papers was in the field of chemical engineering. Uh, this technique can analyze different reaction processes and heat and mass transfer phenomena in different reactions. Uh, there are different uh, configuration for the TGA, for the com common TGA uh, instruments. There are like bottom loading, top loading, side loading. I will talk about it later in details. And uh, TGA by itself has some limitation in uh, analyzing and detecting different uh, phenomena, but coupling TGA with GC, MS, and DSC makes it easier to analyze more complex phenomena. Uh, let's see what uh, um, typical thermogram of TGA can, what uh, information it can give you. Uh, a, a typical thermogram can have different five sections. The first, um, the first section of mass loss uh, can be related to loss of physisorbed water, volatile compounds, and gas trapped in the sample. The, se the second section can be related to uh, chemisorbed water and low molecular weight compounds. And the third, third section, the third weight, lo weight loss can be related to the decomposition or degradation, and it can be multiple decomposition and degradation for some samples, for some complicated samples. And later, whatever remain in the pan uh, can be related to uh, known uh, inorganic chemicals um, like metals or other heavy chemicals. And if you're working in oxidative environment, you might also see a gain of uh, mass uh, that can be related to oxidation, oxidation of your sample. To better analyze a thermogram, it's possible to um, plot the first derivation of the thermogram to give you a better idea of where uh, the slope change and when, when the um, a special uh, uh, decomposition start or end. And also the second derivative can give you a precise uh, location of the start and end place of the, uh, of the um, uh, analysis you're running. Okay, there are different configurations. For a TGA, the, mm, the, for the first common configuration is a uh, top loading that you load your pan over the um, balance and the gas purge from bottom to top. The second possible configuration is bottom long loading or hang down. You hang down your sample simply from the balance and the gas purge mm, goes over the pan and there is also side loading that you load your pan, uh, ha you hang your sample uh, from side of the balance and the gas simply purge over your sample. The problem with all of this configuration is the effect of buoyancy. If you are working with a high flow rate of the purge gas, the purge gas can make a can affect the um, weight you're measuring on your pan because on the counter, pan on your reference pan, pan there is no uh, heat uh, heat up and there is no purging gas flow so the purging gas flow can make a uh, can be a source of error on the weight you're measuring this problem can be solved in some special uh, new TGA that the, mm, there is a counter pan in uh, a separate furnace with exactly the same flow you're uh, purging over your sample and it can cancel the error of the buoyancy effect from the purging gas. Okay, you know, you think you know, know about everything about TGA, you go in the lab, you start testing a sample. You put a sample of 60 milligram in your TGA. The next day you come and you do another sample and you see a deviation of 100 degrees Celsius and you have no idea what's going on. Now, what we call, 
um, be called this effect is calling the it's coming from external heat and mass transfer. What's happening here is that top layers of samples block the lower the lower level layers of sample and prevent heat and effective heat and mass transfer to your sample and can make an error. So to do a um, correct um, TGA analysis, you should go with as low as possible mass that you can uh, load on your pan and to make sure you're getting the best result is that you go as you should go as low as possible and if you don't see any change in the thermogram anymore that's the correct way of the sample okay next time you think you know you know that you, this is the weight of the sample you should start with you should go for example with two milligrams and you start doing a sample and again you see okay it's changing what's happening uh this one it's because of internal mass and heat transfer effect on your sample uh, this, uh, this comes from that um, different particles has a different, uh, uh, different size of particles can have different heat and mass transfer rate. It's obvious that smaller particles can be heat up faster. So again, you should start, if you're especially using TGA to find the kinetic, you should go with this as a small as possible particles to find the correct kinetic. Otherwise you're dealing with uh, heat and mass transfer, not your reaction. Okay, as I said, it's possible to find kinetic by um, TGA. There is the International Confederation for Thermal Analysis and Polyrometry. They have published really interesting papers and uh, publications about how to convey different tests for finding kinetic by TGA. I suggest check them. Uh, if you want to use TGA to finding kinetics, they are really interesting. But the most common uh, method to find kinetic by TGA is, uh, is a conversional method. They are different uh, way to solving them. There is differential method and integral method. As one of the sample is uh, a starting method you can see here that you can plot uh, um, a ratio of temperature to again temperature and the a slope of this plot is related to activation energy of your reaction. Uh, one of the most famous is uh, the conversional method is the Kissinger is the most famous one. That's, as I said, it will relate the activation energy to heat and rate and temperature of the TGA. There is also the method of invariant kinetic parameters that's uh, working with uh, non-models, non, non, uh, I can't say. Uh, based on web of science, uh, we could uh, group uh, the paper that cited TGA to five cluster, uh, clusters. The, the first group is non is mm, nanoparticles, performance, and drug derivative as the most cited papers. The second group is crystal structure, is a catalyst, is a MOFs. And the third group as the most cited, as the most mentioned uh, uh, key, um, papers with this keyword that cited TGA is composites, nanocomposites, material behavior, polymer, and uh, flame retardant. The fourth uh, cluster is pyrolysis, biomass, kinetic, cellulose, and combustion. And the fifth cluster is adsorption, water, wastewater, and uh, um, removal of uh, different uh, uh, impurities from the, uh, your sample. I talked about the sample size, the sample mass, but what's the effect of uh, heating rate? Heating rate also can shift your uh, thermogram. A higher, um, a higher heating rate can shift your thermogram to higher temperatures. And this is actually a way to find kinetic by TGA. You heat up your sample at different heating rates and based on the changes that happens to your thermogram, 
mm, that different models use these shifts to measure kinetic by TGA. We also try to find the reprodu reproducibility of TGA equipment. Uh, of course, this reproducibility really change from one TGA equipment to another, but uh, as the, um, a common TGA uh, that normally it's it there there is in most of the labs, the um, after two repetition, the nine uh, ninety five percent of confidence confidence interval uh, stay within uh, one point five degrees Celsius which is really good temperature for when you're working at high temperatures above 300 or 400. Uh, as I said, the main limitation in TGAs is heat transfer and heating rate. For example, you want to analyze a, a process at 400 degrees Celsius, but TGA uh, needs to ramp up your sample up to 400 degrees Celsius and cannot uh, do it suddenly. With most TGA, there is a limit limitation on heating ramp, and it's normally maximum 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, and if you want to analyze a bigger sample, for example, you have a sample which is not homogeneous, so you cannot take a really a small part of the sample and put it in TGA. Your sample is not homogeneous. You want to uh, use a bigger sample. So, um, in, uh, there are some novel TGAs that can solve this problem. For example, in a full life bed TGA, you can put larger samples, but by fullization, you can improve the heat transfer. There is also induction heating uh, TGA that uh, it can heat up your sample faster. And uh, the novelty about this design is that it injects the sample it heat up the sample to the temperature you need, and then your sample will be injected to the sample at high temperature. Uh, it's fullizing, so it has higher heat, heat transfer and uh, it's induction heating, so it's faster. There is also microwave TGA that I don't need to say, but obviously microwave has uh, high heating cap capacity, so uh, it's easier to heat up your sample in a really uh, fast, uh, in a really short time, and you will remove the error belonging to the heating ramp, to the short heating ramp. Okay, the, to summarize everything, uh, mass uh, and uh, mass, some sample, mass of some the sample and the size of the sample can control the heat and mass transfer of the sample. So you should be really careful uh, what are you choosing as your sample weight and sample size. And uh, in uh, uh, depending on the TGA equipment you're using, you should be mm, mm, careful about the gas flow you're choosing on your sample. The higher the gas flow, the higher the error of the counterpants. And, uh, as I said, there are like mm, the main limitation of thermogravimetric analysis uh, are, are belongs to the temperature. Mm, while most of the reactions that uh, we chemical engineers study might happen at temperatures higher than 800 or 900, most of the TGA equipment, their limitation is at 800 and 900. And TGA equipment cannot, uh, the current uh, uh, TGA equipment in the uh, available, they cannot uh, change pressure over your sample. So if you want to study a sample, uh, a reaction at higher pressure, common TGA equipment, they cannot uh, do it for you. And I talked about heat and, heat and mass transfer limitation of a TGA equipment and the novel TGA is that Maybe you cannot find them in the market, but uh, you can design it by yourself. Uh, are uh, fullized bed TGA, microwave TGA, and induction heating TGA to maximize the heat transfer and remove the error of the heat and mass transfer from the TGAs. Thank you, everyone, for listening to my talk and. 
that's it. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. We have time for one short question. Anyone, anyone from the audience? Um, if not, I, I do have a, a short question <laughs> myself. Um, very interesting this uh, uh, fluid ice bed, TGA. I didn't know that those things existed. I mean, I, I, I don't quite understand. So how, how does it work? I mean, do you have an inert uh, fluid ice bed and you put the material that you want to um, uh, analyze as part of that fluidized bed or, or, or is the material fluidized itself? Uh, yes, uh, really good question. In this uh, fluidized bed TGA, you have your bed uh, that you already measured. The whole bed will be set on a really uh, precise balance. And uh, you have your bed that you already measured the weight of the change of the weight with uh, temperature and changing of the fluidizing gas. So mm -hmm. you know the effect of the fluidizing gas on your balance. And uh, after that, you put your, you add your sample to the fluidizing bed and measure the weight of the whole bed with heating up the, your sample and fluidizing it. So the bed is, uh, is a, it's an inert bed, at least the original yes. bed, yes. right? That obviously should not uh, interact with your sample. Yes, yes, okay, interesting. So it's really to promote better mixing, I suppose, right? So to get a better heat transfer uh, in, in the whole system, so. Yes, yes. Yeah. I... Very, very interesting. Any, any other questions? I don't see any question from, there is one question here. Okay. Do you want to come here and ask? Because other people should also answer it, should hear your question. Uh, you can repeat the question, Nushin. Okay. Okay, really good question. Here, Mario is asking how is possible to um, couple TGA with other analyzing technique. Um, uh, here at TGA, there is an exhaust gas going with your purge gas from the furnace. Uh, to better understand the degradation that's happening with your sample, you simply connect the exhaust to another gas analyzer, you know, like MS, FTIR, or GC, and then you can see mm, different gases that's emitting from your sample at different temperature and different time. So you can better have, you can have, get an um, idea of the uh, mechanism that's happening with the degradation of your sample. That's it. Thank you. All right. So Dalma, would you like to introduce the next uh, speaker? Yes. Uh, however, I don't see him in the... Is... Oh, is he oh, presenting yeah. in person? Okay, super. Okay, uh, please welcome the next speaker, Jean-Philippe Arvé uh, from Polytechnique de Montréal, and he will be presenting differential scanning calorimetry. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm happy to be here today and present you uh, some of my research and uh, work about the use of the DSC. Um, before I start talking about this equipment, I wanted to share some experience that I have with the equipment because I'm using, I'm using it on a daily basis. So I'm going to share a couple of examples here, which are directly connected to the importance of thermochemistry in engineering. So most of the talk will be focused on inorganic chemistry, high temperature chemistry. So of course, thermochemistry is important because you want to, at the end of the day, to be able to predict what are the phases that may form in a system, in an alloy. So this is an example of my research where I'm synthesizing stainless steel and looking at some inclusion that are forming in these materials. And of course, thermochemistry can uh, predict and help us to understand what type of inclusion would form in these materials. We can also use thermochemistry to understand compatibility with different type of material. So here you see a DSC test that I'm gonna talk about later on, where you clearly see the corrosion of the niobium oxide slag that we added inside this alumina crucible. And finally, uh, thermochemistry can be used to understand the thermal stability of different chemicals. And this is nice because Nushin just presented the TG 
uh, work, and I'm going to focus a little bit on this uh, in a moment. So uh, it's important to uh, use thermochemistry, and for that, we need measurement. And this is why I decided to purchase a DSC and work on a daily basis on this kind of equipment. So I enlarged the image of this um, decomposition process of a copper sulfate uh, uh, hydrated uh, chemicals. And you can see here uh, the um, evolution of the mass as function of temperature. And we can also predict this kind of behavior using thermochemistry. So that's why I had a high interest in this equipment. So basically in my research, we're doing a lot of uh, Gibbs free energy minimization using a software that is uh, developed in our research group and uh, we need data. So I decided to purchase a, a DSC and to use it on a daily basis to be able to access some of these fundamental thermodynamic properties. As an example, we're working now on the enthalpy of formation of some uh, compound intermetallics in situ inside the DSC. This is one of the work I'm gonna show later on. We can also use a new type of rod to be able to measure the CP of some chemicals or some intermetallics. And finally, the DSC can also be coupled to, uh, to a, a TG, so we can do also a TGA analysis. Now that you know a little bit about uh, why I'm so uh, interested in this equipment, I'm gonna define a little bit what is a thermal analysis. So Nushin just presented the TGA. I'm gonna try to be a little bit broader and explain to you what uh, is my definition of thermal analysis. So basically it's to try to identify when you're heating or cooling a system, what would be phase transition and reaction that can happen in a system by monitoring different things. So it can be the heat flow, can be mass changes, it can be also evolved gas, we just talked about that, um, and so forth. So what are the assumptions in this specific case for heat flux DSC that I'm going to present in a moment is that a heat flux between a sample and a blank measured by thermocouple or thermopile can quantify the heat effect associated to these phase transition. And basically, the requirement for this kind of measurement is to be able to calibrate using different uh, reference material. So this is one of the key aspects of this uh, of this uh, technique. So I'm trying to present here briefly a map of all the thermal analysis that I'm really uh, focusing on in my research and that we can use uh, in, labor in labs. I highlighted in gray the, the equipment that we'll not necessarily talk about today. So drop calorimetry, which is a really interesting technique, but takes time and is really expensive to purchase, is one of the methods that you can use to really quantify uh, the CP of different uh, intermetallics or chemicals, as well as the enthalpy of formation, enthalpy of mixing. So this is a really important equipment, but it's not the focus of the talk for today. We also have, uh, in terms of thermal analysis, of course, uh, differential thermal analysis. So we call this in the equipment that we have, the 1D sensor. And this rod is, uh, or this equipment is, is used to identify phase transition, and uh, compared to the other uh, plug and play rod that we'll see for the equipment that we have uh, are not that expensive. Then we have what we call singular furnace DSC. And this is uh, what uh, the result that I'm gonna uh, present today are coming from. So in this kind of single furnace DSC, we can do two types of measurement. We call this 2D uh, DSC. So we can have a heat flux DSC. And also nowadays uh, we can uh, use Calvet type sensor it's a thermo, uh, thermopod that allows us to uh, measure the, the heat effect associated to phase transition or chemical reaction. Uh, we also have some double furnace DSC, so we call these one power compensated, but we'll not talk about that today. So basically the theory is very simple. So I'm gonna focus here on the calibration, which is quite important, especially when you deal with um, system at higher temperature. So the calibration procedure is not that complicated. We need to, uh, to know and uh, have some high, high purity elements of known uh, fusion uh, properties. So I listed here uh, some elements that are used to calibrate the equipment. Uh, so we see the temperature of fusion as well as the heat of fusion. Uh, in my case, in inorganic chemistry, in high temperature uh, thermochemistry, we need to use other elements, which could be nickel, so on and so forth. So uh, we, we know this uh, melting temperature. We want to scan around plus or minus 100 degrees Celsius around this, uh, this uh, phase transition temperature at different scanning rates. So basically, uh, even though we're looking at thermodynamic properties, this equipment is uh, measuring a dynamic, uh, dynamically uh, these quantities. So we have to 
to account for the heating ring, etc. So typically we're doing three uh, scanning rates uh, here, 5, 10, and 15 Kelvin per minute. Uh, we repeat this, uh, this, uh, this uh, measurement at least five times to be able to calculate an average temperature and to, uh, to understand the sensitivity of the thermocouple or thermopod that we're using. We're doing the same thing for the calibration of the, the enthalpy or the heat flow. So basically we're integrating the raw signal that we get from the measurement. And by knowing the theoretical value of these enthalpy of fusion, we're able to evaluate a sensitivity factor that is after that used to calibrate the equipment and obtain uh, quantitative measurement. So there are many applications. I, I think I can talk uh, for days about uh, the application. So I dif divided in three different categories. So we really have what we call the fundamental properties, which in my group are used to, uh, to generate phase diagram data. So it can, it can be associated to liquidus temperature, solidus, eutectic uh, reaction. We can also use uh, DSC for heat of reaction uh, or phase transition. So allotropic transformation, we can look at the melting of, of alloy or chemicals. Uh, we can uh, have a look at the uh, oxidation, reduction, dewatering. So all these uh, fundamental characteristics. And we can also measure uh, CP with uh, the equipment that you see here. Uh, I'm not going to talk into about uh, low temperature DSC measurement. So we're aware that we can measure glass transition, crystallization, melting. But uh, really, I'll focus on the high temperature. So uh, the inorganic chemistry that we're doing in our group. So we can do a lot with this equipment. So we can look at uh, heat treatment of uh, alloy. We can look at uh, pyrometallurgical processes like calcining, roasting. Uh, we can also uh, use different types of gases. So we can uh, work under ox uh, oxid oxidant uh, condition or re reducing condi uh, condition. And we can uh, also play with mixtures and uh, study more complex pyrometallurgical processes like carboreduction, aluminothermy, all, all these kind of uh, processes. So here is a couple of examples that we published recently and which highlight the use of the DSC. So in this uh, first project that was published uh, this nitrates. So molten uh, nitrates are used to perform the heat treatment of aluminum alloy. And when we add lithium to these aluminum alloy, we were uh, afraid that some chemical reaction could happen. So basically what uh, we studied are the melting characteristics of different uh, lithium containing alloy to see at the end of the day if there would be chemical reactions. So the first step was to study the melting characteristic of these aluminum alloy. We also then mixed uh, shaving and, and punch sample with uh, nitrate to see for a potential reaction. Uh, this is another example of the heat capacity measurement that we performed recently. So in my group, we're using a lot of uh, theoretical, um, uh, let's see, uh, work to uh, predict what would be the CP expression of, as function of temperature. And we, we want to validate these prediction of the CP as function of temperature. So now we are measuring, uh, in this case, aluminum, but we're looking at the CP measurement of intermetallics and other type of systems. Okay, so in terms of uncertainty, like I said, it's an indirect measurement method in this case. So there are many, many factors that can impact the quality of our measurement. So of course, uh, the heating rate, the, the gas flow, the crucible type that we're using, all these operating conditions will have an impact on the measurement. So we need to calibrate for the specific operating condition. Then the sample preparation is also critical in our case, especially when you're dealing with metals or alloys. Uh, you have to remember that uh, we're using tiny amount of uh, samples so on the milligram uh, scale. And of course, the morphology or the type of material or sample that we're using will have an impact on the measurement. Uh, sample reactivity also is an issue. So we need to, to be aware of the volatility of our sample, the oxidation, the potential oxidation, the corrosivity of the, the, the sample with uh, the crucible. And of course, we need to uh, be aware of the thermo thermocouple sensitivity. So just to get a, a feeling about the type of error that you can get from these measurements, this is uh, coming from our calibration uh, technique. So we, we see here the measurement uh, that we did of the melting point of pure aluminum as function of the heating rate. So you see that we measured five times this uh, melting and we were able to obtain an average value and a standard deviation from this 
uh, from this uh, average value. Same thing for the um, for the effect of the heating rate or heating rate sorry on the uh, enthalpy of of melting. So that's the type of error that you can get. Uh, here is an example of the the partial pressure of uh, some element that you can get in these samples. So when you deal with high temperature, you can have a high vapor pressure of different elements such as zinc, magnesium, and lithium. So you have to be careful of the shift in chemical composition of your sample throughout the measurement. Of course, the crucible compatibility is an issue, uh, especially at high temperatures. So this is only uh, a non-exhaustive non list of type of crucible that can be used in DSC measurement. So for metallic system, typically we are using alumina crucible, but of course this depends on the type of material that we're using. Uh, for salt, which are really uh, a hot topic at the moment for, um, a, a, for a, a heat storage, uh, we typically use platinum crucible. Sometimes we can reuse them, sometimes we cannot. So uh, we're aware of that. And finally, when we're dealing with polymer, we can use less expensive aluminum crucible. And to that, we can add the uh, customized crucible. So we can use pressurized crucible. We can use a uh, boronitride crucible, so on and so forth. And just, this is just an example to show you that uh, even when measuring uh, standard material, we have to be careful because in many cases, uh, chemical reaction can happen between the sample and the crucible. So you see here the reaction that happened with, between the alumina crucible and nickel, which is used as a standard material in this case. So what are the perspective in this kind of uh, technique? So I'm sharing with you some of the results that we have uh, obtained recently. So we're, we're really interested in my group in, uh, in intermetallics that are present in different uh, alloys. So what we're trying to do at the moment with the DSC that we have is to perform in situ synthesis of intermetallic and to try to obtain the enthalpy of formation of these intermetallic to be able to tune the thermodynamic model that we are developing. So you can see here uh, one of the, one of the uh, measurement that we did. So we were able to synthesize in situ and intermetallic and evaluate its enthalpy of formation. And with uh, it's a fast technique and it worked really well. And you can see the, the measured value with uh, some other uh, technique that were used to obtain this uh, same uh, property. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for your attention. And I would like to thank my collaborator. So Dr. Kentaro Oishi and Paul Lafay who are my left and right hand who are doing the measurement. So I'm talking about it, but uh, these are the people that are doing the measurement. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jean Philippe. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Okay, we don't have any questions. We're a little bit uh, behind uh, the schedule, so I'll let Professor Soares introduce the next speaker. Thanks. Good uh, Next speaker is Jan Fuzwang from the Cal Polytechnic Montreal and uh, talk about reactive extrusion. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Yang Bazuan. I'm a PhD student in Polytechnic Montreal. And today I'm going to introduce the, our reactive exclusion review paper for the chemical ex uh, for the experimental mass association. So, what is the reactive exclusion? Thank you. So the reactive exclusion, also known as the uh, reactive processing, uh, that is a that is a polymer manufacturing method that combines chemical uh, reactions with the traditional the melters the extrusion process in one extruder, and the extruder works like 
uh, screw reactor uh, for the extrusion process. And also the, the, the extruder and the barrels can be the segmentals uh, in the extruder for this the reaction the process. Mm. Extruder is better, it's suitable to run the faster kinetic and small entropy the reactions. And also the currently the major the chemicals, the technical, the challenges of the reactive the active exclusion is the process the scale up, uh, the process, the control, and also the design of the auxiliary equipment. And in the traditional uh, extrusion process, uh, real, rheology models are interested for us, but the, in the reactive extrusion, the real, uh, we care more about the real kinetics model. So in the following the slide, I'm going to introduce more details about the reactive extrusion. Uh, normally the extrusion, can be can run the several types of the reactions. So, uh, for example, the ex reactive exclusion can run the Barker polymerization to produce the PMMA, and also we can use the polycondensation reactions to produce some some polymers. Um, um, also, uh, in the exclusion process. Normally, we need to modify some properties of the final products. So in this ways, we can use the reactive extrusion to modify the, some specific properties of the polymers. So we can use reactive extrusion to, uh, to run some reactions like the functionalizing, uh, compatibilizing, and also the graphiting and close linking reactions. And if we need to produce some like cold polyesters, we can also use the exchange the reaction. And there is a promising application for reactive extrusion is the, is the, is the polymer recycling. Um, degradation always happens the, in the extruder, but if we can control the degradation, it means we can control the molecular weight of the polymers. So we can use the degradation to produce some value added the chemicals. So for example, the in the, in the industry, so we can use the reactive solution to, uh, to recycle the PET and PMMA material. And normally the cold rotating twin screw extruder is the most used equipment for the reactive extrusion. Um, single screw extruder and counter rotating twin screw extruder are also used in some uh, situations. Uh, this is a picture of the cold rotating twin screw extruder. The, this, the, this kind of extruder has the has a segmental the design of barrels and the screws. And normally the extruder contains the some like the polymer, the fading pods, side fading pods, and several the degassing the pods. And liquid injection injection is also possible in the reactive extrusion process. And normally the liquid injection pod is near the is nearby the Polymer, the many fading the parts, and also the screw, the screw configuration is also the is is also in a spatial the designs the we uh, the configuration can be divided in the several the functional zones, and normally this the this the zones contains the fading, melting, convening and also reaction venting and uh, also the compression uh, also the compression the zones and the profile and the temperature and the temperature profile is also the special uh, in the reactive in the reactive exclusion and pressure is a measurable parameter in this process and the pressure performs uh, ups and down the behavior uh, on the extruder. And differently, the temperature is um, controllable and the measurable the parameter. 
So we can also we can uh, also uh, design the, some like the zoning the zoning temperature the profile for the extrusion. It means we can control us the some uh, some places the temperature on the extruder. And here we investigated the bibliography, like the map of the, the active extrusion. And as you can see, the the we we found us the there are three the clusters the, in the reactive extrusion. Uh, for the first the for the first cluster, we can see the blender morphology are the most important the linked keywords for the reactive extrusion. And in the second the clusters, we found the mechanical property and uh, poly uh, PLA uh, are the most important uh, linked uh, parameter, uh, the sorry, keywords for the re reactive extrusion. And it's not uh, difficult to understand that the, because the, in, for reactive extrusion, we normally needs to modify the mechanical properties, some of the polymers. And also the, we can say the PLA is a hot, the research topic for the reactive extrusion. And in the last the clusters, we can find the, the, the top linked keywords for the reactive extrusion is the crystallization and also the rheology. And here, is, this is a pair of the 3D, the screw, screw the elements model. And uh, normally the melt, the melt will flow, will flow through the channels of the screws. And uh, we find there are several uh, limitations on this process. Uh, it means the reactive extrusion is not a perfect uh, technology for all the polymers uh, handling. And the first uh, limitation for this process is the, is the low the retention time of the melt in the extruder. And this means the uh, only the faster, faster reactions are suitable for the reactive extrusion. Uh, normally, the retention time of the of the extrusions the ranges the, from several uh, seconds to several uh, minutes. And the second uh, limitation for this process is the uh, uh, is the temperature the controller and the temperature controller is not always easy in this uh, in this process because the some unexpected and uh, some unexpected high temperatures may uh, result in some the polymer degradation in extruder. And also high temperature may uh, uh, result in some um, undesired site reactions in this process. And uh, for high reaction enthalpy, uh, for high re reaction enthalpy, especially for the stronger, uh, for the strongest the uh, XO, uh, X, XO's, uh, the XO's the reaction, the stronger temperature rise uh, is very dangerous uh, for this uh, process. And here is a, pro a typical the process for the production of the TPU using the reactive extrusion. Uh, the production of DPO using the reactive extrusion can potentially meet 60% of the global demand of TPO material. And normally the reactive extrusion process needs uh, many the upstream and downstream the devices. Uh, in the, for the upstream the devices, uh, we need the dividers and mixers, uh, for example, and for the downstream the devices, we normally need some like the palletizer, dryer, cooler, and some like the polymer melts, the shaping the equipment. But the, we can say the reactive extrusion are also facing some technical uh, challenges. Uh, first of all, the first of all, 
the volume to the, the surface to volume ratio uh, of the extruder uh, decreases as the scaling up uh, of the process. So this means the scale up is always uh, is sometimes not easy because the because the heat removal is not easy in a large sized re reactor. And also the process controller and uh, monitoring sometimes are not easy because we need a very accurate the in process the monitor and the controller for the reactive extrusion. The quality of the final products are sensitive to the process, the controller. So if we want to keep the very high the quality of the polymers, the final products, uh, we have to take care of the process, the controller. And also the fat and sorry, and also the auxiliary equipment design uh, is also a limitation, uh, technical challenges for the reactive extrusion. Uh, for example, if we need to dose a small, uh, tiny stream of materials into extruder, uh, it's not always easy. Uh, for example, if we need to, um, if we need to eat 1% of rate, 1% of the, some liquid catalyst into the extruder, it's, it's, uh, it's not the uh, easiest work to do. And here uh, in the reactive, in the traditional reactive, uh, sorry, in the traditional extrusion process, we can see some the rheology models, but in some reactive extrusion process, we care more about the real kinetic models and the viscosity of the reactive, the medials are relate, is related to shear rate temperature, the reaction conversion, and also the molecular weight. Here, uh, here I show you the one example of the viscosity profiles for the polymerization reaction in the reactive extrusion process. Mm, the, the, visc the, the rheological properties of the reactive extrusion can reflect the chemical transformation and uh, also the effectors, the reaction, the progress. And here you can see the different the polymerization uh, reactions can show the different the viscosity profiles in this process. Okay, and reactive solution is a very hot the topic the, for the polymer the research, and the, but the, we found us the many companies are many com many companies keep the this technology as a business secret. So it means it's not always easy to find some uh, some basic the theories or uh, knowledges on some published articles. Uh, normally we can find the many interesting technology about the reactive exclusion in the patents. So in this means it, uh, so this means uh, we need to study the theories uh, uh, we need to study the theory of the, this the process. And also the degradative extrusion is a promising process. Uh, it's a promising ex application for this process. And we can use the, this the technology to recycle the polymers. And also uh, we can use these the, promising technologies to produce uh, some precious uh, products like the membranes, the materials. And finally, uh, the function uh, modification and the functionalization are still the important for the polymer processing uh, industry. Okay, and that's all of my presentation today. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Yofan. Uh, any questions from the audience? If nobody has a question, I will wait for somebody else. Down, sorry? If nobody has a question, I have one myself. Okay. Um, Yanfa, when uh, you're using a 
the clean screw extruder. Do you seal the extruder completely or you leave some space? Uh, excuse me, sir. I, I can't hear it's clear. Yeah, the question uh, perhaps we um, when you when you use a clean screw extruder, do you completely fill the extruder with your polymers or you leave some space? Uh, sorry, Tom, can, uh, can you repeat again? Can I can I try, Dama? Maybe he can hear me better. Yeah. What she asked is uh, when um, you use a twin screw extruder, is all the space filled with polymer, or there is some space that is not filled with polymer? So there is some empty space there, or is it all filled with polymer all the time? Uh, for a single screw extruder. Uh... A twin twin screw. It's yes, but for trim screw extruder, it's not. Normally, the trim screw extruder uh, has uh, staff the feeding model. It means that it's impossible to fill the to fill the whole of the extruder completely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I have a uh, any other questions from the audience? If not, I have a quick one, uh, um, uh, Yafa. So uh, uh, reactive extrusion is a relatively uh, uh, old technique. It's been around for a long time. Uh, what, what are the, the new advances in uh, reactive extrusion? Uh, the new advances for reactive extrusion, I can say something like the, the, pol the polymer recycling, the plastic recycling. Uh, for example, in Europe, they are using the reactive, reactive exclusion to produce the to produce some chemicals from the PMMA the uh, wasters. And also, this this is a promising the technology to produce some membranes the materials like the proton exchange the materials. Uh, that's the top hot, the hot topic currently. Okay, very good. Thank you. I have a question. Can I, can I come on the stage and ask? Yes, you can ask uh, one final quick question, yes. Okay. So uh, to follow up with Yanfa just said uh, about the, the, the plastic recycling. So uh, what do you think uh, the future holds? What, what do you think is gonna happen in the future? Which kind of plastic uh, will, like the extractive extrusion will be able to uh, address and recycle? Um. I can say the some like polyesters can use the reactive exclusion to recycle, and uh, also some like P, uh, as I know the some companies are using the reactive exclusion technology to recycle the PE and also the PP. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, when you say, I mean, it's a, I, we, time is very short, but um, it's a topic that uh, I have a lot of interest in polymers. So when you say recycle, it's, it's really, it's more like um, bringing up a new uh, application for it, right? Because if you, you do it reactively, then you change the nature of the polymer. So if you do a reactive exclusion of a polyethylene or polypropylene, what you get in the end is not what you started. So you're not really recycling, but you are, well, I suppose you have, a, you create a new product in the recycling process. Is that correct? Mm, sorry, uh, case. So re recycling in my mind, it, it, it's more linked to the, come using the same thing again for the same use, right? So I had a polyethylene film and I recycled it. So I make another polyethylene film with the same properties or at least as close as possible. Now, if you use reactive, extrusion, you are, you are doing a reaction with the polymer molecules. So the molecules after the process will behave differently. So you're really creating a new product in the recycling process. Did I understand that correctly or, or am I confused? Uh, here? Yes. Uh, yes, normally the after the extrusion, the molecular weight of the polymers the, will degrade, but uh, in the reactive extrusion, you can add some uh, some chemicals inside to increase the molecular weight of the polymer. And there are two types of the recycling, the mass salt uh, using the active solution. One is the reduction of the molecular weight. And another one is you can increase the 
you can increase the molecular weight of the polymer. Yeah, so no, I understand that, but if you increase the molecular weight of the polymer, you change the properties of the polymer, right? So decrease in the molecular weight, change the properties, increase in the molecular weight, change the properties. So what you get in the end of the process is a different product. It's not a bad thing, but it's a different product, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, yeah, we, we can, I mean, we are, we are pretty behind the schedule here. So, but you know, interesting presentation. Uh, but just think about it. I mean, it's, you know, it, um, it is, you really, it, it's a good thing. You maybe you even adding value to the product, right? But you get a different product at the end of the recycling. So not the same product. If you increase the molecular weight, for instance, right? I, I, I suppose, I, I think Dalma will be introducing the next speaker. Is that right, Dalma? Or is that me to do it? Yes. Um, uh, can you stop uh, screen sharing, Yampa, please? Sure. Uh, the next speaker is Shahab Golshan, and I hope I pronounced your name uh, correctly. And he will be uh, presenting optical fibers, uh, sorry, optical fiber probes for multiplate systems. Uh, and he's from Polytechnic Montreal. Oh, he's presenting in person or online? Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, can you see my screen and my presentation? Uh, yes. Okay. Perfect. So first of all, you pronounced my name correctly. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this presentation is a part of a series of tutorial reviews on experimental methods in chemical engineering. I will introduce the theory of fiber optic measurements in multi-phase contactors and discuss the operational challenges. I will also explain the calibration, applications, limitations, and sources of uncertainty in optical probe measurements. Granular material is prevalent in nature and it's the second most used material in industry after water. Uh, approximately half of the products and 75% of the raw material in chemical industry is in the form of granular materials. Gasification, pyrolysis, coating, granulation, uh, drying, and mixing of, uh, are examples of these industrial applications. Generally, uh, researchers use pressure signals, acoustics, uh, computated tomography, radioactive particle tracking, and optical measurements, uh, besides spectroscopy to study fluid solid systems. Among these techniques, optical measurements are less expensive compared to the other methods, for example, at least 50% cheaper than CT and easier to implement. Several works in the literature compared the measurement accuracy of fiber optic probes with X-ray tomography, RPT, and positron emission particle tracking for bubble diameter rise velocity and particle velocity. This research confirmed uh, the high accuracy of fiber optic probes, for example, less than 10% discrepancy in holdup measurements compared to CT was reported in a research. Fiber optic probes are produced in various types of forms, including two parallel light emitting and receiving optical fibers, uh, parallel optical fiber bundle probes, uh, cross optical fiber probes, and parallel optical bundle, uh, bundle fibers, which all have their advantages and drawbacks. Uh, there are several bundles uh, on a probe tip, uh, while each bundle consists of, uh, consists of multiple arrays of fibers. In the uh, recent fiber optic designs, uh, the arrays send and receive light. Alternately, uh, blind regions are areas uh, that light fails to illuminate or fails to return to the probe. Uh, parallel optical fiber bundle probes reduce these blind regions. For other types of probes, a glass window at the tip of the probe is necessary to reduce uh, blind regions. After re uh, receiving the reflection of the emitted light, photomultipliers convert the light signals into electrical signals. For example, for simple applications like uh, solid sold up measurements, a single bundle on the probe is adequate, but uh, measurements of particle velocity or bubble velocity uh, require at least two light emitting receiving bundles. <clears throat> By using fiber optics, we can measure local hydrodynamic properties, including particle velocity, uh, solids fraction on voids, uh, which are difficult for heterogeneous flow systems like the spotted beds, arisers, and uh, cylindrical turbulent fuel, uh, fluidized beds. Uh, among different methods of holdup calibration, solids dropping in a downer is the most popular method uh, for uh, gas solid systems. The calibration is based on uh, uh, is based on signals from particle mixtures with various uh, holdup values. These mixtures consist of uh, various concentrations of white and black colored powder that are used in the experiments. 
In the calibration, we pour these mixtures through a tube uh, to maximize the signal to noise ratio for visible light measurements. The entrance and the exit uh, of this downer are sealed. We first pour the particles into the pipe from above and allow the particles to accumulate on the bottom valve. A few seconds after the solids level rises to the height of the probe, we open the bottom valve slowly for the particles to exit the pipe and record the signals from the probe. The setup simulates a loosely packed motion of particles in front of the probe. A sample with only black particles represents a completely empty region with a holdup equal to zero, uh, while a sample with only white particles uh, represents a loosely packed bed flow. Uh, every probe bundle must be calibrated separately. Generally, uh, the voltage uh, signal varies linearly uh, with concentration of black to untamed powder. However, in some cases, like when the probe tip is damaged due to collision with rough particles, this relation becomes nonlinear. Using care fitting, <coughs> uh, we derive equations to link the average volta voltage and uh, solids holdup for each uh, probe bundle and use these equations for measuring the bubbles in the main experiments. Calculating the particle velocity requires at least two receiving sending bundles on the probe. Uh, the velocity equals the ratio of the effective distance uh, between the two bundles and the time delay. Uh, the effective length is approximately equal to the distance between the bundles of the probe, but changes uh, if collision with particles erode the probe tip. <clears throat> we use a chopper disk to calibrate the probe for velocity measurements. Instead of circular chopper, we can use a uh, belt driven stepper that moves along a horizontal plane linearly. High voltage section uh, in this calibration curve correspond to particles packing, uh, passing in front of the probe bundles. <clears throat> the delay between the signals uh, on this figure relates to the real distance between the probe bundles. This delay is obtained using cross correlation of the signals. In systems like the motion, uh, in systems uh, that the motion of the particles in different directions may happen, for example, in spotted beds, we have to find uh, the cross correlation using the both bundle signals. For example, in spotted beds, the dominant motion uh, direction of the particles in the spot and annulus are in the opposite directions. Uh, once we calculate the cross correlation in both directions, cross correlation values reveal the dominant motion direction and we apply the maximum time lag in the dominant, dominant direction uh, for velocity calculations. <clears throat> the spot diameter can be derived from the time average radial distribution of particle velocity or time average radial distribution of solids holdup. When we are using particle velocity, uh, the spot diameter is defined as the radial point, as the first radial point <clears throat> at which the velocity becomes zero. On the other hand, the spot diameter uh, is defined as the inflection point of the radial distribution of solids holdup. Uh, the bubble rise velocity and size calculations are interconnected. <clears throat> Consider a fluidized bed with a single bubble rising from its bottom. Initially, the probe is in the dense phase and the corresponding voltage uh, signal is high. When the probe is inside the bubble, the signal drops. Finally, when the bubble passes the probe, uh, the signals of the bundle return to the dense phase value again. The bubble length reported by the probe is not necessarily the maximum bubble length. <clears throat> the bubble length is the product of the bubble velocity and the time interval uh, from when the signal drops from a high level to a low level and then returns to the high level again. For each bundle, we have to find the threshold value to determine whether uh, the probe tip is inside or outside the bubble. We estimate these threshold values using the calibration uh, experiments explained earlier. Uh, when the signal value is below the threshold, the probe is inside the bubble. <clears throat> calculation of bubble velocity follows a similar method to the calibration of particle velocity. When a bubble reaches the probe, we calculate the time lag between the data of the two bundles uh, using a maximum uh, cross correlation coefficient and convert this to a bubble velocity. Particles may fall uh, inside the bubble in the fluidized bed from above. Because of this, the uh, holdup of bubbles is not equal to zero or pure gas, and it generally increases as the bubble rises inside the bed. We can measure the bubble holdup using fiber optic probes easily. The main challenges that I faced uh, using fiber optic probes and their main sources of error are, are uh, light noises. This is important for optical probes operating with visible light, calibration uncertainty, probe tip erosion, rotation of probe during experiments, disturbance of bed uh, by the probe, 
<clears throat> since uh, probe measurements are in invasive methods. Cross correlation coefficient threshold, a standard deviation multipliers in the elimination steps, a sampling frequency, and number of data segments. Average particle velocity linearly increases more than 36% uh, when the effective length increases from 1.7 millimeters to 2.3. This shows a strong dependency of the measured particle velocity on the effective length of the probe. The probe tip is in continuous contact with uh, moving particles, which erodes the probe and changes the holdup calibration curve. High density particles like zirconia can totally destroy the probe tip. To mitigate errors due to erosion, we recommend to calibrate the probe frequently, like every 10 hours of operation. Uh, choosing a low cross correlation coefficient threshold uh, leads to inclusion of weak uh, data or loss of acceptable data for average velocity. Average particle velocity slightly, approximately 4%, increases by increasing the cross correlation coefficient threshold from 2000 to 8000. We recommend that researchers uh, use a standard deviation multiplier in the range of three to five uh, because the smaller or larger values may exclude or include outliers. With increasing the data segments, the number of data in each segment decreases. As a rule of thumb, each data segment should contain at least signals of motion of two to three distinct particles. Average particle velocity increases slightly uh, 4.5% uh, with increasing the number of data segments from 20 to 60. Uh, so the main limitation that I faced uh, working with uh, optical probes was uh, that uh, these probes are unable to detect particles smaller than fiber, fiber diameter. And some probe designs are un unable to detect uh, transparent particles like uncolored glass beads. So if you're using uh, transparent particles, you have to paint them uh, before the experiments. For future works, I suggest uh, the application of fiber optic probes in three phase reactors. <clears throat> we can use probes uh, for early detection of agglomeration in fluid eyes and spotted heads and for detection of flow regimes. Uh, here you can see the references and uh, I would like to thank uh, the supervisors of this work, professors uh, Gregory Patience, Jamal Shoki and Bruno Bellet. And uh, thank you for your time and attention. I have so um, it was a very good presentation. Um, I would like to conclude uh, uh, the this session of the experimental method symposium. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, at twelve thirty we have uh, the um, annual general meeting of uh, energy division of the CIC. So please uh, join, and we'll start again at two uh, with the second with the first session. Um, of the afternoon for the experimental medicine symposium. Thank you, thank you everyone, and see you. See you later.